the bounty hunters. Hey, you more for popcorn or chips? The skinny man says as she walks in. He's got two aqua-haired women draped over him like he's posing for some magazine and is pointing to a pair of bowls filled with salted treats. You said you had something to show me? I do indeed. They're favorites on the ship, so me and my girls will be watching too, Mustard says with a grin. What are they? Security footage, tournament recordings, and a pair of indie broadcasts that play concurrently. I see. I presume that these show tactics, cultural effects of human impacts on the galaxy, they do indeed. The security footage is of Pukey. One of the tournaments is how the hat was introduced to the Crimson Hewers. The other was a massive cultural affair that severely impressed an entire species called the Apuk, and the indie broadcasts were from a pair of sadist mass murderesses that a member of the EFL took down on their own terms and absolutely shredded them, overpowering one and outsmarting the other. Interesting, and what did these moments lead up to besides impressing these Apuk? In chronological order, there's the taking of the chaining and remaking it into the chainbreaker. Also how Pukey and Cindy met and rescued Scaly. The next two happen at the same time. One's the Apuk tournament and the other is one of the final blows needed for the EFL to conquer a frontier planet called Vuxa 5. After that, it's the Hat proving himself in a tournament and making one of the best first impressions possible on the Crimson Hewers. And the last one is Pukey fighting against a one-woman army and fighting this force of nature to a draw before outside help gives him the win. Interesting. What can you tell me about the Apuk before we start? No, 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 hold on. What do you mean by the EFL conquered a planet? It was a frontier world that only technically had official representation and was being run by numerous criminal gangs. You do know I'm going to be confirming that, right? Officer Shield asks, and Mustard just nods. Go right ahead. Now where was I? The Apuk. Madame Stepanova notes as she makes a mental note of questioning the officer for the information she's currently digging up. Fire breathers that evolved from turtles and were lifted out of, I don't know, the 10th century, somewhere in the medieval ages when they were given modern tech. They have a warrior culture and a title called Battle Princess, which is basically the elite of the elite. It's legally considered attempted suicide to provoke one and actual suicide to fight one. It's a race that we got off on the right foot with and have been pushing forward on. And what foot was that? Officer Shield asks, as she sits not too far away from Madame Stepanova. The naturally armored officer is becoming more and more of a welcome and acceptable presence. She's far from stupid and far from noisy, which is pretty much all Stepanova asks for in an escort. One of our soldiers seducing and being seduced by a battle princess, and then getting into a competition with her about who can be the most lovey-dovey in the relationship. The contest has gone on for more than half a year with no end in sight, and the entire Apuk race is burning with jealousy about that one girl's damn good luck. More things have escalated, but that's a long conversation. Suffice to say, they like us. They really like us. Oh, come on, it's not silly, it's sweet, Andrea remarks. Yay! For the guy who swept our fins out from under us, you just don't have any... Whatever Roth was about to say is cut off by Mustard pulling her in for a kiss. Andrea cuddles in as her cousin gets some sugar. But before they can continue, there is a bang and all of them look to see an upset Madame Stepanova with a firm grip on her cane. Start the show, she commands. Please. A few taps of Mustard's communicator and a large image is suddenly projected from a white screen that unfurls from the ceiling. It shows Captain Schmidt trapped in what appears to be a glass bell on a floating platform in a room coated in purple, gold, and glitter with an entire crowd of aliens below. He's been badly beaten and still has both eyes and arms. One hand on the glass as he glares down with purest rage and the other seemingly folded, but there's something clearly in his hand. 
Is there just some program you have to control this ship from every room you're in? She asks him and he chuckles. Yep, but only if you have a permanent residence on the ship. As a guest, you're not getting that kind of control. She lets out a huff and he presses a something on his communicator and the image begins to play. Sounds a little fucked, but considering what he did, I'm sure you'll understand. She snorts in amusement at the idea and watches as Captain Gregory Schmidt earns his command, his scars, his limbs, and his girl, also a respectable body count. Her eyebrows go up when he incorporates his fancy new arm into a cannon and starts going full ham. The rest is just a compilation of death dealt by Gregory until it finally ends with him sending a blast of plasma fire down into an area that causes the entire facility to go up in smoke. The last few images show him boarding the chaining with a communicator stolen from a pirate he killed near the end and using her severed hand to access it. After that, he went from slave pen to slave pen and passed out the weapons before getting that ship out of there and getting in contact with the Dauntless. There was some help in his retreat from some parts of the EFL. I see. What's next? The night we of the Chainbreaker helped take Vuxa happen pretty much at the same time as the Apuk's Broken Shell Tournament, also called the Shellcracker Tournament. So which do you prefer? Both show pretty good examples of Axiom used in combat. What are the rules of the tournament? No attacking the audience. If your armor is broken, then you're out, and if you attack someone who's already out of their armor, you're disqualified. Also, if someone who's disqualified takes a pot shot into the free for all they're straight up arrested. It doesn't happen, but it's good to know, Officer Shield says, and Stepanova slowly turns to regard the woman. I watched it as it happened. There was a lot of drama in the last two, first when he showed up then when he didn't. It turns out that they were spending some quality time together for so long they missed a multi-day tournament. Yes, yes, so the little boy we're about to see has been derelicting his duty in favor of a pretty face. Let's see what we don't have access to then, she says, and the tournament video begins. The other contestants tower over him like Amazons wearing stylized metal turtle shells where he's just a man in uniform with a blue metal shirt over him. All the color from reality suddenly stops and he casually walks around and shatters their armor before leaving. Then it cuts to the next round where the contestants are clearly more wary and preparing to do something. Then he shouts and the round ends immediately because the moment the fight begins, the armor of everyone but the young man in blue chainmail shatters. Has he been interfering with the flow of time in two different ways? Yes, but keep watching, Mustard says, and she does so. In the next round, he has to face off against his own trick and get around a brutal flurry of attacks in a chaotic mess that he seems to flow through like water. Then he rips a full-size sword from the floor beneath him and uses it to gain the upper hand as he slices through fire and visibly runs electricity over it to tase his opponents even as he hacks and slices at them with the sadistically barbed sword. What? Madame Stepanova demands as the next round shows Vernon simply tagging in a tree to do the work for him. He almost seems to wait out the round on the tree and then it finishes the job for him as she stares. He's a sorcerer, some kind of special axiom user of the Apa culture. They're nuts for men like that. It's the gold standards of husbands and him bringing the tree in is pretty much their signature ability, Mustard remarks before shrugging. I don't get it much myself, but they like it and they like us for it, so I can't really find room to complain. Hmm. Madame Stepanova remarks and her eyebrows go up during the next fight, as Vernon seems to have decided that being the living embodiment of a jump cut was a proper way to fight as he flickered in and out of reality and apparently hit with the force of a big rig. There's a lot of movement and they're clearly trying to catch him, but when the person you're trying to stop seems to think physics are for chumps, then it's pretty much impossible. He wins again before the next round. This sixth round, he literally rips all the heat out of the area, leaving it a frozen wasteland with a microscopic star in his hand. A star that is his weapon. 
Even when it's taken from him, he uses it as a distraction or a weapon by destabilizing. Then he gets angry, very, very angry, and focuses on one in specific and uses all his tricks to tear her down in moments. Then he shatters his own armor and walks away. Everything is dead silent at that point. He just broke the tournament to make a point. He threw the tournament because she insulted his wife? Madame Stepanova asks scornfully. So many missed opportunities with proper status on an alien world. It's romantic, Officer Shield protests. It got him a personal invite to meet the Empress of Serbo and all sorts of things happening with that move while also slipping into cultural memory and getting a lot of attention, Mustard remarks. Next movie, this one's a bit gorier. It starts with two screens at once, both of them done found footage style by a pair of complete lunatics, one a wolf woman and the other a massively bald multitude of women that are quickly exposed as being many serpent women born from the same bodily base. They both outright commit murder on numerous people they have contained and then go hunting for more victims. The many-bodied woman mentioning that she's being cheeky and seeing if she can sneak prey out of the wolf woman's territory. They find a human man in a large red coat that clashes horribly with his hair. It looks like alligator hide, but isn't. That's not dyed. The boy's been hunting, Madame Stepanova notes. They found something about smart enough to be malicious beating a child to tenderize its veal. They rescued the kid and dragged the monster to its doom before butchering it alive and eating it. Most of them made belts and boots. Franklin Smith there went for a full-size coat. What was it? Chelt Flame Spewer, I think it was called. Apparently the fact that it was an evil bastard made the meat taste better. Those things are maybe ten generations away from becoming people, Officer Shield says in a somewhat haunted tone. Are they still animals? Madame Stepanova keeps the topic on topic. Yes, but only just. Officer Shield admits, well that one was a baby-eating psychopath. Better that it's out of the gene pool. Stepanova notes. She's starting to warm to these idiots out in the galaxy. Competence is a suit that always looks good. The wolf woman finds him first and he's ready for her. Coldly dismissive and brutal. He shuts down and overshadows the axiom techniques of the monster. Then she seems to cut the world in half. It shifts and cracks as he heals his hands and then slams the continental plate down and seems to heal the world. The witch calls up her dead victims in desperation and Franklin's response is the ancient fossils below. The multi-woman interferes and shatters his toys, but his response is to literally rip all the power out of the air and then when the sadistic wolf begs for the power to be returned, he agitates it and force feeds it to her. Madame Stepanova cannot help but smile at the sight of the giggling lunatic reduced to charred bones. Then, the multi-woman confronts him, and the fight is strange. He seems to be toying with her, deflecting and countering her attacks with ease. He taunts her, and she loses her control as something strange is going on, something very strange. The multi-woman is only able to use her abilities after pulling at something from the air and mostly from Franklin. Then she starts pulling endlessly, and then everything breaks down and it switches to another camera. There's a shockwave near the camera that skids it somewhat and the main body of the multi-woman just shatters. What just happened? Madame Stepanova asks. His tactic with the second one is to trick her into accidentally creating Null. She pulls at so much of the local axiom that she can't use her abilities, then notices he's still got plenty with his tricks. He then baits her into taking as much as she can and then she has too much and it collapses into null, which is why the cameras switch at the end. Makes sense. She couldn't even stand without at least some background axiom, could she? Lydra struggle to so much as breathe without axiom, a battle they lose eventually. Mustard remarks, the next video is straightforward. A Roman-style coliseum but with metal as Bangani Chabalal exits in a chrome leotard with a pugil stick and hat. 
He then makes a mockery of his oversized opponent despite her having what appears to be an engine on a stick for a weapon. Then it's revealed that he's packing an electrical current in the ends of the pugil sticks and after a tussle, he's disarmed. Then he reveals that apparently everyone fights with magic now and conjures magic hands to disarm her and then eventually throw her face first into a wall, knocking her out cold. The odds were hundreds to one. We cleaned out the house and were forbidden from betting in that arena again, Mustard says with a chuckle. And someday that's going to be what they show a child for how their parents met, isn't it? Madame Stepanova asks, and Mustard nods. All right, this last clip doesn't have much to it. It's a few minutes at most. But for context, we track someone who paid off some snipers sent to watch a potential riot into taking a shot that they didn't need to take. There was a riot brewing. We traced her back to the friend whose name she used to pay for things, and in order to get her away from the rest of us, Pookie had himself blown out the airlock with her. He had a Kutha-based device that allowed him to survive in the vacuum of space. He fought her for a while, but she eventually got her head on straight and proved that she once held the title of Battle Princess. She's a monster in pink, Mustard explains. The video shows a feral-looking woman in ruined finery teleporting in with Puke, who breaks her grip and manages to escape. Her response is fire in enormous amounts and the area starts taking absurd heat damage. A large black monster confronts but doesn't attack the woman as a slight silhouette recognizable as Captain Schmidt circles around. Then everything seems to shatter and the woman is impaled on the tail of the monster and Schmidt is in its clutches gasping for breath. What just happened? Observe. Mustard says, and the video is replayed at a thousandth its previous speed. It's still over too fast to be properly tracked. But she can make out Captain Schmidt charging through the flame so fast he leaves awake, attacking the woman, being dodged despite compressing the air around him in his sheer momentum, and then somehow reversing it to attack twice more. Once gets blood and the other is dodged. She gets the upper hand on him when the monster reveals it's just as capable at moving at these sonic velocities and kills the woman and captures Schmidt. All three of them went supersonic, Madame Stepanova says flatly. Soldiers faster than bullets? The captain here is faster than a bullet. How much has that man been humoring her? How much has this crew been humoring her and her crew if they're capable of such feats? How do you counter straight-up magic in a fight? He killed a battle princess two-on-one, Officer Shield asks in shock. I mean, that's clearly an old and experienced Zed-in, but a battle princess? Even a disgraced one is someone you evacuate the area around, you don't fight them. He won. He got her so hurt and tired and confused that she was open for a killing blow. That's insane. No wonder he was so calm doing a docking procedure in an Axiom lane. The man has never been beaten. But he has, Madame Stepanova says, reconsidering many things. The first video saw him gruesomely injured and initially kidnapped and literally beaten if the bruises are anything to go by. That's right. And that Madame Stepanova is something I wanted to show you, to put more into context. Explain. The first fight with Pukey was him not using Axiom. He didn't know how. It was nothing but grit, skill, and a lot of adrenaline. The second was him using Axiom, and he broke the sound barrier. You saw two of our best Axiom users going all out, and both of them have only gotten stronger since then. Finally, you saw how our team generally uses it in the Hats fight. A few small tricks to turn the tide. It's effectively space magic, but it's reliable and quantifiable. I see. Are there more exotic techniques? Oh my yes. Franklin can straight out disintegrate things and reduce them into raw energy. One of Vernon's earliest tricks was the transformation of his enemy's blood into acid. Axiom is powerful and versatile, and I hopefully gave you a good idea about that. Mustard explains, and she nods. Thank you for showing me this young man. I have much to consider, Madame Stepanova says, standing up. 
She needs to start bothering Officer Shield for what she learned about Vuxa 5 and bounce it off what the people here will say about it. Then she needs to ensure these videos are viewable to her entire crew so that no one mistakes talk of magic or axiom as anything less than a thousand percent serious.